good. All right. Amen. I think we're live now. Live and in color, like I always say. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody here tonight. And before I forget, let me just say uh, thank you to everybody who's watching as well. Amen. Uh, we're glad that you took time out of your night. Amen. To be here, even though it's really cold outside right now. You guys are... Y'all are the hardcore bunch. That's what I say. <laughs> Amen. That's good. Hey, come rain or shine. Amen. And God will bless you for it. Amen. I know it's a little cold outside, but uh, hey, that's why we got jackets, right? <laughs> Amen. Unless the road's real icy and dangerous, I would say. I heard it might get kind of dangerous, though, uh, on some of the roads. So y'all make sure that y'all be careful, too, tomorrow. Yeah, it's supposed to get, some places are supposed to get slick. Um, yeah, there you go like north yeah so watch out for the bridges i know the bridges get kind of icy amen but uh anyways we're, we're here tonight texas I always tell uh because i teach online vicky and uh the kids they're like some of them are in south carolina some are in georgia some are in alabama you know they're all over the place and i tell them i'm like texas weather is weird because it'll be hot in the morning but then at night it's going to be cold so that's why you might see me walking around town with some shorts and a big old fluffy jacket like the one I got on back there, because <laughs> I don't know what to do, amen? But uh, amen, I'm, I'm just happy to be here, and uh, I'm excited, you know, um, the Lord's doing some awesome things, amen? I'm trying to talk a little slow because I got a mint in my mouth, I don't want it to fly out, so I, did, I thought I would be done with it by the time I got up here, but I'm almost done with it, sorry about that, but uh yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see what the Lord is doing. Amen. Can y'all can y'all believe we're almost already in March, man? Man, so three months almost done already. Amen. But hey, God is taking care of us. You're here, breathing alive another day. Amen. And uh, you're you're alive and well. So just always find something to thank God for, Annie, because you can always there's always something to thank God for. You know. Amen. You know, there's sometimes, uh, there's sometimes like when I pray and, uh, you know, honestly, Hector, like, I don't even know what to say. You know, I'm just, you just, you just get lost for words sometimes, you know, and you really, you don't know what to pray, Elvira. And so it's at that time, Vicky, where I just start thinking of all the things that God has blessed me with, even if it's something simple. You know, I got a house to come home to. I got a car I'm driving. I got clothes. Amen. I'm, I'm healthy. Amen. And, uh, we're, we're young. We're happy. We're, and God is taking care of us. Amen. So always, there's always something to be thankful for. Amen. So anyways, I hope you guys are doing good tonight. We're just, we're going to go ahead and jump right into this. And uh, so we'll just, I'll go ahead and I'll let you turn there first. And I'll probably just keep talking, but uh, turn to the book of Jude. See if you can find that. <laughs> Jude is actually, it's right before Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And uh, uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight while we're here is something I kind of touched a little bit on on uh, Sunday. And uh, I had mentioned this scripture, but I didn't read it to you guys. I don't think I did. And uh, I kind of wanted to explain it a little bit more. And I wanted to give you a little bit more uh, to this to this chapter here, because I think I could be wrong, but I think I might have preached on this before, or I might have at least mentioned this scripture and talked to you guys about it. Well, you'll find out what it is in a minute. But even so, I think it's important that we go back to it anyways. And then, like I said, uh, I'm going to give you some new stuff to consider today, too. Amen. And uh, hey, before we get started, uh, Brother, uh, Brother Albert kind of asked an interesting question <laughs> when we first started. And uh, not anything serious. I thought it was kind of neat because I never really thought about it. But uh, he had said, like, you don't ever see anywhere in the Bible where it was cold. You know, it never mentions that they did stuff when it was cold, unless I missed the scripture or something. And he was just asking, like, why is that? You know, well, sometimes you kind of have to read in between the lines because, um, like, we were talking about it. And it says that when Jesus was, uh, when he was taken from the disciples after they left the Garden of Gethsemane and he was standing before the, uh, the Sanhedrin, it says that Peter was warming himself by the fire. And so that's just kind of like an indicator that it might have, it was probably cold because he was warming himself by the fire. Amen. 
So it might have been cold around the time that Jesus was, was crucified, too. So, uh, but the Bible just never specifically says it's cold or it's hot, maybe because it's just not important, you know. But I thought that was an interesting question. I don't know if y'all ever think about stuff like that, but uh, that's, that was a good question, Brother Albert. Anyways, okay, we'll jump right into it, okay? All right, <laughs> let's see. Jude, uh, verse 3 and 4. Okay, let's see. I'm going to read it from my Bible. You can go ahead and put it up there, Pastor Larry. All right, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay, so he just begins by saying, I wanted to write to you about the common salvation and faith that you had. He says, but instead I decided to write to you about this, because obviously there was something going on that he needed to address. Okay, and then in verse four, he says what the problem is. He says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Have y'all ever heard somebody use that scripture before where he says that people have taken the grace of God and they've turned it into lewdness and they deny the Lord God? I've heard it used before like this, and this is what I wanted to address to y'all tonight. Some people say, and again, I mentioned this a little bit on Sunday, that you have to be careful, Brother Albert, of those pastors that pr preach grace, because what happens, Elvira, is when you teach too much grace, again, this is what they say, I'm not teaching all this, when you teach too much grace and when you preach too much grace, it's eventually going to turn into, give people a license to sin. Okay, has everybody heard that before? Yes. Yeah, like you can't preach too much grace because if you do it, people are going to feel like they can do whatever they want. And the reason why I kind of wanted to address this tonight is because there are still people out there, Vicki, that are saying that, that too much grace is a bad thing. Okay, and what do y'all think? Do y'all think too much grace is a bad thing? I don't think so because the Bible says that like I said on Sunday, it's hyper grace. It's grace that super abounds. In other words, it's not just God just doesn't give us grace. He gives us more grace, grace upon grace, overflowing. And then again in Titus, it says that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. And so the cure, so when you look at somebody, I want y'all to listen closely. When you look at somebody, Elvira, and you see that they have an issue with sin in their life. They're doing something that you know isn't right, and you know it's not right. God knows it's not right, and I bet you anything they know it's not right, and we've all done stuff like that before, right? When you look at somebody that's doing that, the answer is not to give them law. The answer is not to give them condemnation. The answer is not to say, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to fix yourself up. You need to uh, get yourself right so that God can forgive you. Are y'all following me so far? That's not the answer because the Bible clearly says that the way for somebody to deny ungodliness and to live a righteous moral life is grace. You give them grace and you tell them to come to Jesus just as they are and bring all of your sin, bring everything that you're doing and allow God to change you, because you cannot change yourself, no matter how hard you try. Peter said in the, in the book of Acts, they were trying to figure out whether or not we should, the disciples should put, bring laws back into the picture, because they knew that Jesus had ended the law, and they were saying, okay, should we still try to live by some of the law? This is in the book of Acts. You'll read about this soon. And then Peter tells them, he says, why should we put a burden on them that we nor our fathers could keep? 
So in other words, he was saying, we could never keep it. They could never keep it. And if you, you are reading the Old Testament, so you know they constantly were failing, sinning, making mistakes, and they never lived up to the law that God had initially, the old covenant, let me put it like that. They never lived up to the old covenant that God had gave them, right? And so that's the reason why Jesus came, because the old covenant and the blood of bulls and goats was not enough, guys. So Jesus had to come and sacrifice himself. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's the answer, guys. The answer is grace, and it's looking to Jesus Christ, right? But what some people do, I've, I've heard this verse used a lot, and to say that you can't teach grace so much, you have to balance it out with works and law as well, so that people won't think that they can do whatever they want. Now, I'm going to say this to everybody here. If you're saying that today, you need to stop saying that. Stop saying that there are people out there, pastors, that are saying it's okay to do whatever you want. Because I've been in this thing for over 15 years, and I've never heard one pastor say, we have grace, so go do what you want. Never. Yet there are people who are saying that pastors like me or just, you know, people that preach grace are saying that. But I've never said that before. And I've never heard a pastor say that before. Can you honestly, like, fathom if there was a pastor out there who said, we have grace, so just go and do whatever you want, guys. That You've never heard that before, right? So why are we standing by our pulpit saying, well, there's a lot of pastors out there saying that you can just do whatever you want. Nobody's saying that. So you need to stop lying because that's what you're doing when you say that. You are lying, and lying is not good. Amen, somebody. Amen. <laughs> All right, y'all are looking at me kind of like, I'm not, I'm not here to attack anybody today. I'm just trying to set something that needs to be said, right? <laughs> Okay, so again, who is saying that? You're saying there are pastors who are saying you can do whatever you want. Who's saying that? Nobody. So you're lying, right? Because nobody is saying that. That's just what you think we're saying. But we've never said that before, right? So we, what we have to do with this scripture is we can't use it to preach against grace. Because the whole New Testament, the book of Acts and all the epistles, is all about grace, and it's all about how grace changes you. So why would, it, why would this scripture mean right here that grace is bad for you or that it turns into lewdness? Like that word lewdness means like a sinful lifestyle, right? So what is the meaning of this scripture then? And what is Jude trying to say? So what we have to do is look at that. Uh, can you back up uh, one slide, Pastor Larry, real quick? And let's look at that verse four real closely, okay? Okay, sometimes you just have to read real slow and look at it word for word, right? It says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, okay, go ahead, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so y'all follow me. So first we see that there were people who have crept in unnoticed and they were starting to turn the grace of our God into lewdness. In other words, they had began living, like I said, living a sinful lifestyle. So the key to understanding this scripture is looking at what it means to turn the grace of God into lewdness. Now, does anybody know the answer already to that? Okay, good. I picked the right message then. Amen. So, Pastor Larry, pull up my slide, please. Okay, I know it's kind of hard for you to read because this is just a screenshot I took. But the word that we're looking at is the word turn. What does it mean to turn the grace of God into lewdness? So these definitions here is what the Greek word turn means. Okay, now look at the first one. To transpose two things one of which is put in place of another. Or it could also mean to transfer. And then there is another definition that says it means to change. And then C says to transfer oneself or suffer oneself to be transferred, to go or pass over, to fall away or desert from one person or thing to another. So 
usually if you just take like that first line, that's exactly what it means. So I should have put a slide to show you what word I was looking at. But if y'all write in y'all's Bible, circle that word turn, because that's the word we're talking about. And I'll give you the Greek word too, okay? So we're having a little Bible lesson tonight. Is this okay? Okay, y'all stay awake. <laughs> All right, I'm just playing with y'all. So let me give you the Greek word real quick. It's M-E-T-A, the word tithe, T-I-T-H-E, T-I-T-H-E, and then M-I, like me, metatithomy, metatithomy, metatithomy. <laughs> Sounds like a name, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a M-E-T-A, like meta. And then tithe, like a tenth, and then me, M I, metatithomy. I should have put it up there, but I figured I can just tell it to you guys. Metatithomy. <laughs> That's the Greek word, and this is what it means to transpose two things, one of which is put in place of another. So, in other words, what people do, so y'all just try to listen like real closely to what I'm saying, is they take that scripture, Jude, Vicky. And they say, you see, if you preach grace to people, what happens is that grace turns into sin in your life. But if you, but that's not correct, right? Because that's what they're saying, right? Too much grace will turn into sin in your life. In other words, it will literally transform or become sin in your life. Are, are y'all following me so far? Okay. But according to the Greek word, that's not what it means. It means that what happens is that they've taken grace and they've put it aside and they've replaced it with sin. So in other words, the grace does not become sin in a person's life. What happens is that you can take the grace off the table and replace it with sin. Y'all understand? Okay, so it's like this. Uh, let's see. Let's say... Uh, Let's say, okay, let me do this. Let's say that my Bible is grace. So this is good, okay? And my phone is bad. This is sin, we'll say. So this is grace. This is good. And this phone is bad. Okay, what people are saying about that scripture, Jude, Elvira, is that when you have too much of the good, it literally transforms and becomes the bad, like that, okay? That's, there's a difference, okay? Y'all follow me. But what this scripture is saying is that what people do is they take the good, put it here, and replace it with the bad. So my question is this. Did the good turn into the bad? What did I do? I replaced it, all right? So in other words, grace is not the culprit. Grace, the message of grace is not bad, and it's not going to make you sin like people are saying it's going to do. The message of grace does not, give, does not make people sin. If you receive the message of grace, and then let's say somebody does begin to maybe live a sinful lifestyle, it's not the message of grace that caused them to do that because grace doesn't make you sin. It teaches you to deny ungodliness. So what happened in that circumstance? They replaced the grace, and they put sin on the table. The grace did not transform into sin. Y'all get that? There's a difference between replacing something with something and then that thing actually transforming into something. Because if grace was able to transform and change into sin, then there's, then there's a possibility that it could be bad in your life, right? But that's not the case. People are just replacing the grace with sin, all right? Y'all follow me so far? Y'all look. Do y'all have any questions? Y'all look a little lost. Okay, y'all get it. <laughs> okay. Now, that that word metatithomy, just to give you another example, it's also used in a Hebrews chapter seven verse twelve. So if y'all want to turn there, I'll show it to you real quick. Hebrews chapter seven verse twelve. Okay, and then as you're flipping there. Again, let me just restate 
that what a lot of people are saying is that grace kind of transforms into sin in a person's life. That's why you need to balance it out with law and with works and, and stuff like that. But that's not what this scripture is saying. So we need to stop using Jude to preach that. Amen. Okay. That's why I always tell you guys, and Pastor Larry does too, it's very important for you to kind of slow down and really see what the scripture is saying and not just, this is what it sounds like it's saying, so that's the way I'm going to interpret it. You understand? Okay. Uh, yeah, we can read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12 real quick. Okay, this, we, we know this scripture here. It says, for the priesthood being changed... Of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Okay, so the word I want y'all to pay attention to there is that first word, changed, for the priesthood being changed. Now, if you've been coming to this church for a while, you know, you know about the old covenant and you know about the new covenant. And you know in the old covenant there was a priesthood, and that priesthood has been replaced with a new priesthood, which is now you, because you are the priests, and Jesus is the great high priest, okay? In the Old Testament, there was the regular priest of Levi, and then there was the high priest, right, Aaron. Now, that's been replaced. That's been taken out of the way, and we have a new priesthood now. So, this word changed here is that same word, metatithemy. In other words, Look at it like this. The old priesthood of Aaron, Alma, did not transform into the new priesthood. It was taken out of the way and something new was put in its place. A new priesthood, which is us. Okay? Okay, so I just wanted to read you that scripture to kind of help you understand what that Greek word means. Okay? So, and I, I wanted to outline this as well because we often, we look at people who might might have been like coming to church or might have been it, it seems like they really grabbed a hold of the message of grace and they really it really seems like they were changed but then we get confused because we see these people they might they might seem to leave that and you're wondering well was it the message that pastor was preaching that made them go out and do whatever they want to do and the answer is no guys because grace does not make you want to do that for example, I think I said this Sunday, but if you have a loving spouse that doesn't cheat on you and buys you flowers and candies and chocolate, tells you they love you, amen. What else, guys? They give you a hug every day, amen. They, they tell you that they love you, and, and, the, and the passion and the love in that relationship is there, right? And so you would be a fool to go and cheat on that person if you have everything that you want in that person, right? But a lot of the times, and y'all might know this, when it comes to marriages and things like that, people begin, their eyes begin to wonder whenever they're not getting what they want in their marriage. And that right there is what makes them want to go to somebody else, right? It's the same way with Jesus and with grace, Grace is, is perfect. Jesus is perfect in your life. He loves you unconditionally, right? And he gives you everything that you need. Now, when you are truly receiving that and you truly see that, it's not going to make you want to go out and sin. Amen, somebody. It's not going to make you want to go out and hurt Jesus. The problem is, is that sometimes we take our eyes off of Jesus and then we end up going astray. But the, but the problem was not in his love. The problem was not his grace, the too much grace that he's given us. The problem is that we took our eyes off of that grace. And that makes us do things that we should not be doing. Okay? But again, that's not what people are saying. They're saying that the message of grace is what caused you to do that. And that's not true. You need more grace. You need to see more grace in your life and if, if you want to be changed. Because if I just start giving y'all law every time you come in here, I bet you every single one of y'all are going to start walking out that door one by one every Sunday. Amen? Because you're going to be like, I can't do it. It was like that. Amen? Some of y'all were at churches that were uh, kind of like that, right? They preached a lot of law to you. And 
you feel like you have to work every time you go into church. And you feel like every time you leave, man, I'm more screwed up than the way I came in because now I have to do this and do this and do this to get right. But if they would just told you that you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, that there is grace, that it covers a multitude of sins, that you have perfect love in your life, and all you need to do, Albert, is just keep your eyes on that. Keep your mind on that. Focus on that. Don't focus on keeping laws and rules and all that because you can't do it in the first place. Focus on Jesus, and you know what? Naturally, all these good works are just going to flow out of you. Amen? And you're just, you're naturally going to be good to your wife. You're naturally going to be good to your husband. You're naturally not going to cut people off in traffic. Amen? There's been a lot of road rage going on lately. I've been seeing on the news. Amen? You naturally will not do that if you have your eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen? So you need more grace, and I'm going to give you more grace, and it will be up to you, yes, to keep your eyes on the Lord so that it can transform you in your life. So what happens when a person gets the message of grace? Because I've thought of that too before, Denise. Like, you know, I, I've, I've looked at myself, Pastor Larry, and I've been like, you know, this is just for an example. Like, I see people that will cry and they'll say, man, I've never experienced what I've experienced at your church. I've been changed by what you and Pastor Larry are saying. And then two months from now, I don't see him anymore. And I wonder, I'm like, well, you said that you were changed by everything that we said, that you've never felt anything like this before, and that this is is it for you. And then two months later, you stop coming. And I think, I'm like, well, is it something, is it the message of grace? I don't really think this a lot, but some people would think, they would say, well, is it what Pastor Jamie is teaching, grace? Because that person just said, you know what, I'm loved by God anyways, I can just go out and do whatever I want. That's not really the case. If you ask me why people, one of the reasons why people just leave is because the cares of the world get in the way and they stop making time for the Lord. It's that simple. So one of the possibilities of when we see somebody like that is, is, is that, that they put the cares of the world in place of grace. And that happens all the time. Amen. Jesus, when he gave, y'all need to go home and read the parable of the seeds. Amen. Jesus said that some people received the word, some people got it, but then the cares of the world came and choked the word out of them. Or Jesus also said there's a certain kind of people where the seed goes out, but it falls and it just kind of falls by the wayside. In other words, they come and they hear it and it, it hits them, but then it just kind of, they don't receive it, in other words. But there is such a thing as kind of receiving it, but then just replacing it with, a, with the, your old kind of lifestyle or a sinful lifestyle. Amen? So, but I, wanna, I, want to, I want to really hit this home that it can never be that too much grace has turned into sin in your life and has caused you to sin. That is never the answer. The answer is not the message that you heard. The problem is that you allowed other things to things. The problem is that you allowed other things to come into your life and you replace that grace with those other things. Amen. Are y'all hearing me? It's not that the grace has transformed and made you sin and has turned into sin in your life. It's that you replace that grace with something else. And all you need to do is put it back. Exactly, right. So again. Jude sounds like it's saying that on the outside, right? But if you look at the Greek word, that's not what it's saying. Amen? And I'm not the only pastor that's preaching this, guys. Uh, There are other pastors that have dissected this scripture and have figured out what that's actually saying. Because how can it say over here that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and it's the cure for sin, and then over here it seems to be saying that the message of grace can become sin in your life. It's not saying that it can become sin in your life. It's saying that you can replace the grace with sin in your life, okay? There's a difference. There's a difference between replacing something with another thing and then that very same thing transforming into sin. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Amen. Now, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 8. Y'all quiet, man. Why y'all so quiet? (laughs) <laughs> and Pastor, Jay, Pastor Jamie ain't mad. He ain't mad. I promise y'all. <laughs> Amen. Romans chapter 6. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 8. And, and, you know, uh, I, I'm really glad that we're fixing to we're fixing to start kind of teaching some of the foundations again, Pastor Larry, that we wanted to do here in church, because there again, guys, there is a lot of preaching out there that is it's grace mixed with works. And, and that's not good. You're never really, Vicky, going to go into a church that preaches all works that where people are going to say, you're saved by totally works. You got to work for your salvation. That's it. But what people are going to say is that you're saved by grace. Yes, that's true. We believe that just like you, pastors. We believe the same thing you do. But then they are also going to say, but you have to keep that salvation by working, doing good works. So that you're saved by grace, but kept saved by works, Crystal. And my question is, is that the gospel? <laughs> no, that's not the gospel. So we have to we have to rightly divide the word of truth, as the Bible says, right? Okay, Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. So what I wanted to do here with this passage is I just wanted to remind you guys of a few things that grace says. I'm going to give you, I'm actually, I just got three things for you. I'm going to give you three things that grace says, or you can say like three truths about grace. And I bet you anything, we're going to be talking about this very soon. So if you are taking notes, you, you might want to write this down. Amen? Okay, one thing that grace says is that you're forgiven of every sin. Amen. I should have got a hallelujah shout. Amen. Somebody, sh somebody should have stood up and started running around the church when I said that. Amen? But no, nah, I know you are. I'm just playing with you. I know you are taking notes. Uh, it says you're forgiven Grace says that you're forgiven of every sin. Amen, Amen somebody. Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. And let's read Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. Verses 8 through 11. <laughs> it's me, the way I preach, right? I'm kind of like, it's like I'm getting to it, but then I don't get to it. <laughs> Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. It says, I'll just read it from up there. It says, now, if we died with Christ... We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin twice for all people. Yes? No. <laughs> Amen. Y'all caught that. Did he die twice? Did every time you sin, did he, is he going to go back to the cross and die for that sin for you? No. He died to sin once for all. One time. One God, one time for death, right? But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. You guys are dead to sin, amen? But alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So I want y'all to really focus on the fact that Jesus Christ died once for all sin. One time. Okay. How you're probably asking, like, how does that play into forgiveness? Okay. Well, I'm going to show you. Okay. We're doing a little Bible study tonight. So I want y'all to now jump over to Hebrews chapter 10. So we were in Romans 6. Now jump to Hebrews chapter 10 and just look at verse 10. Hebrews 10, 10. Hebrews 10, 10, and we're going to read 10 through 14. All righty. It says, But that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. There's that word again, once for all. We've been sanctified by the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. 
well, what's he talking about there? Now he's talking about the old covenant and the priesthood then where they constantly uh, sacrificed animals daily, yearly. They would sacrifice animals for the sins of the people. And he's making a distinction here. And he's saying the priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Here it is again. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified amen and we know that the book of hebrews teaches that the only way we can get forgiveness of sin vicky is through the shedding of blood that's it in other words i don't understand why people are saying you have to ask for forgiveness to be forgiven because asking for forgiveness does not purchase forgiveness according to the Bible. What's the one thing that can bring forgiveness in your life? The shed blood. Amen. Blood is the only thing that brings forgiveness. I didn't say that. Hebrews says that. That the shed blood of Jesus is what brings forgiveness. Now, now that we know that, look at this scripture and the one we read in Romans, where it says that he did it one time and that he's not going to do it again. In other words, every time you slap your husband or kick your dog or cuss your cat or get drunk or go to Sunnyside, I'm just kidding, Jesus does not go back to the cross and shed his blood again, right? Because you might be saying, oh, you know, I, uh, I, I uh, talked back to my spouse today, and we would all agree that that's a sin, yes? Okay, how do I get forgiveness of that sin? Come on, uh, class participation. How, how do I get forgiveness of that sin? <laughs> By the blood, right? The blood of Jesus Christ. But Jesus died one time, and he's not going to do it again. So what does that mean? It's done. Amen. He's forgiven you. He, you're already forgiven because he died 2,000 years ago. So the sin that you commit today and the sin that you commit tomorrow has already been forgiven. So why are we out here trying to get our forgiveness when Jesus has already forgiven you of the sin that you've done? That's what we're taught. Amen. It's like this. Let's say the bank told you that they, you have, they have forgiven you for the debt that you have. Have anybody ever had a debt at a, at a bank, maybe? And the bank called you, Albert, and they said, we're forgiving you of this loan. And they say, oh, you just need to come over here and, and just receive it. And so you get in your car, and, you're, man, I, I, I'm getting forgiven, Denise, of that loan. I ain't got to pay on it no more. And you get to the bank, and they say, we're going to forgive you, but you still have to pay this much and this much and this much. We're, we're forgiving you of the loan, but you still have to pay this much and this much. And you're like, well, then I'm not really forgiven because I still have to pay. That's the way we're teaching forgiveness today in the body of Christ because true forgiveness means that you are totally forgiven. Because if I go to the bank and I still have to pay on it, that means I'm still earning my forgiveness. That means I still have to earn my righteousness. But if I go to the bank and they said, you're completely forgiven, and I don't have to pay any more, then I truly am forgiven indeed. Amen. But you know what some people are doing today, Albert? They have been forgiven, and they know that they've been forgiven. And the bank doesn't even receive their payments anymore, but they're still mailing their payments to the bank. Can you imagine the craziness of that? The bank has forgiven you. They said, you ain't got to send no more money. You're like, okay. And on the first of the month, you sit down and you send the payment. And the next month, you keep sending payments. Why are we doing that? Why are we trying to earn our forgiveness when Jesus has already purchased our forgiveness on the cross? How do I know that? Because it says that he died only one time. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, which means that you are forgiven, which is what grace is. Grace says that you are forgiven of every sin that you've already done. Amen, somebody. Amen. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, just this week, I heard somebody uh, preaching and, um, you know, they, it's, again, it's, it's like mixed. It's grace mixed with law because a lot of the stuff that he was saying 
was really good. I really enjoyed some of the things that he was saying. But then it's also mixed a little bit with works, Elvira. He started to say, Second Chronicles says that we need to pray and ask for forgiveness, and if we do that, God will forgive us. And if we don't do it, we have unrepentant sin, and we're going to go to hell. Okay. But are we forgiven? We're either forgiven or we're not forgiven. That scripture in Chronicles is in the Old Testament, guys. It's Old Covenant. That's why it's very important for you to understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Because Second Chronicles was written in the Old Covenant where they had to keep the law in order to be righteous, where they had to keep the law in order to be forgiven. But we get over here in the New Covenant, and it says that Jesus paid it all. He went to the cross. He purchased your forgiveness. And now we can stand here and say, wow, I've been forgiven of everything that I've done. And it was by nothing that I did. It was all by what Jesus Christ did. Okay, so I'm telling you guys this because you have to, you have to watch out for the things that you listen to. Amen? I'm not saying that I always say everything right. You know, I might come in here next week and I'll be like, I totally don't believe that anymore, guys. But uh, no, nah, I don't know if I'll do that or not. But uh, you just have, we just have to be uh, mindful of what we listen to and, and what we're receiving. Amen? Okay, and then the second thing that grace says is that grace says sin does not separate you from God. Mm -hmm. Sin does not separate you from God. Because that's what a lot of people are saying today, yes? That if you sin, you're separated from God. Well, I got news for you then. You're going to be separated from God all the time. <laughs> because we make mistakes just about, just about every day, right? And we can sit here and try to figure out whether or not we did make mistakes or we didn't make mistakes. But the point is, is that without Christ, we're lost. Amen? And, but there are people who will tell you, Elvira, they'll say, man, you know what? Whenever you do sin, whenever you do pop off to your spouse, you at that time are separated from God. You might be separated from your spouse, <laughs> but you can never be separated from God. Because like I told you guys on Sunday, God, you have to understand the difference between the old and the new. In the old, God did not live inside of people. In the Old Testament, God's spirit was not intertwined with the people's spirits. But in the new covenant, he says, I'm going to be inside of you and you're going to be my people and our spirits are going to be one. This is the new covenant, and Jeremiah talks about it, that this covenant means that I am in you and that nothing shall separate you or take you out of my hand, all right? So if we're going to say, if we're really going to believe that scripture that says that nothing can take you out of the Lord's hand, but then we're going to turn around and say that sin can separate you from that, well, then that scripture is lying. At least that's what I think. But I don't... Uh, I don't have a scripture for you, but uh, I'll just read you a scripture from Romans 8. It says, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And it's in Romans 8. Just go home and look, go home and Google it. Amen. Go home and look for it. But the point is this. Everybody says that, or I shouldn't say everybody, but many people say that, that sin will separate you from God. And living that way can make you so confused about your relationship with God. We were talking about it before everybody got here today, that a lot of us have come out of, you know, very, um, like, religious churches, again, that teach law. And we felt like that, right? We always felt like sometimes we're good with God, and sometimes we ain't good with God. Sometimes we're, we're, we've been living right according to the way we think we've been living right. And Sometimes we're not, and when we're not, we're separated from God, and now we have to get back with God. But church, I'm here to tell you today that grace says that your sin does not separate you from God. Jesus would not sit in the midst of sinners if he was too holy to deal with sinners. But what did Jesus do? He came and he showed us that I get down into the dirtiness of your life. And I'm right there with you in the dirtiness of your life. And again, that should make you want to turn to him and love him more. Amen, somebody. Okay, and the last one is that, I already said this, but I'll say it again. Grace says that you don't have to ask for forgiveness of every sin. 
Grace says that you don't have to ask for forgiveness of every sin. And the scripture I have for you for that one, guys, is in Ephesians chapter 4. The dog's out there saying amen. Y'all hear that? Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 32. And I will read it to y'all. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Notice that word forgave there is in the past tense, meaning Christ has already forgiven you. So now you go and forgive others. But again, we're not teaching that today. We're saying, go and forgive people so that you can be forgiven. And if I don't go and forgive her or him for what he did to me, then I will not be forgiven by Christ. And that's not true, guys. Y'all understand that, right? Y'all understand that you are already forgiven. Christ has already forgiven you of everything you've already done. And so, Another place in the scripture says that when you realize how much you're loved and how much you're forgiven, when you truly get that in your head, it's going to make you want to go out and give forgiveness to other people. It's going to make you want to go out and love others because you see how much God has forgiven you. You see how much that he loves you. And when you truly get your eyes on that, it's going to make you want to go and give forgiveness to other people. Amen, somebody. So, again, this scripture would not be worded this way if we had to ask for forgiveness of every sin. Paul would probably say something like, forgive everybody else just as you, just as Christ has already forgiven you as long as you've asked for it. That's what it should say by what we're teaching today, right? But we do, we cannot ask for forgiveness and God will give it. Again, the only way forgiveness comes is by the shedding of blood. And again, he only did it one time, and he's not going to do it again. So that means that you are already forgiven, church, and you do not have to ask for it. Amen. I'm, I'm thankful, Pastor Larry, that I can wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know what? It doesn't matter how I feel, Diane. It doesn't matter what I did. God has already forgiven me. And you know what? I'm not sitting there saying, ooh, I can go do whatever I want now. I'm, nobody's thinking that. So why are we saying that? That makes me want to come to church. That makes me want to learn more about God, this God who loves me and cares for me, amen, and and who has given me forgiveness. This is the reason why I was doing, uh, I'll say this and then I'll be done. I was reading, I've been reading a book, this really fat book, Pastor Larry, about the early church uh, and how the disciples and them, how they did church, Elvira. And you have to think about, Annie, the way People saw Christians in those days. Think about it, in the days of the disciples. They were in Rome, and paganism and all the gods was normal to them. And so when somebody new comes along and says that there's this God, Jesus, who went to the cross for you, he literally died. To them, to all those pagans, Denise, that's stupid. Because for one, you're saying that a God can die, which to them is dumb. And they didn't understand what Jesus actually did for them. And then, second of all, you're saying that I don't have to do anything that he's already forgiven me. And that paganistic culture, they had to earn their forgiveness. They had to give sacrifices at their shrines and stuff, right? And so, this is the reason why they were persecuted, because they saw that cult, or they, well, I shouldn't say cult, they thought it was a cult. Christians, they saw it as dangerous and just dumb, but to us, what does the Bible say? That God has, using, has used the foolish things to confound the wise. So it doesn't make sense to the world that we can be forgiven and we didn't have to do anything for it. But to us, Annie, we see that that's the beauty of Christianity. That's the beauty of what Christ did for us because we can't do it anyways. Without Christ, we're lost, the Bible says. And so we see that he did it for us and that he's already forgiven us, and that makes us want to love him. Now, to other people, that's dumb. you got to earn it. To other religions, you have to earn it. But with Jesus, you don't have to earn it because he's already done it for you. Amen? 
Keep your eyes on that, and that's going to make you change. Amen, somebody. All right, let's all stand. That's the simple word I have for you tonight. Amen. And that is my message. <laughs> Amen. All right. Amen. So, church, I'm excited about what God is doing. Amen. Now, I wanted to ask before we leave, does anyone um, have any prayer requests? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. We're going to pray for those needs. Vicki, anybody else? Any needs? Yeah, Alvaro? Oh, Yes. Okay, all right, yes, yeah, so we're going to pray for that, Elvira. Anyone else before we leave? Amen. All right, well, let's bring these needs before the Lord. Amen. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your, your spirit and your goodness in this house tonight. And, Lord, we just we bless you for what you're doing and for your word and for your spirit and just everything you've done for the people in this church, Lord. We, we love you and we just we bless you and we honor you tonight, God, with your with your awesome presence in this place, Lord. And Father, we, we thank you for the needs that have been brought here tonight because we know, Father, that uh, this is your time to shine, Lord, as we put these needs before you for Vicky's, for the, the family, Lord, and, you know, the issues that are there with the, you know, whether there's sickness or anything like that, Lord, we speak against it, and we lift those two family members up to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we just ask, Lord, and we declare, Father, that there would be a complete restoration in that situation. Heal the bodies, Lord. Just bring peace of mind to them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And keep your hand on Vicky's need in the name of Jesus. And for Elvira's sister, Lord, we just, we lift her up to you. And Lord, we speak and we declare just victory over the pain, Lord that there would be no pain in the name of Jesus, no pain whatsoever when she gets back or, you know, whatever that situation uh, ha has. Lord, we just speak, Lord, healing, restoration, peace of mind in the name of Jesus, and we believe that it is finished. It is done in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for doing that work. And, you know, Lord, if, if there were, you know, any other needs in this place tonight, Father, we just, I want to lift up those needs to you, the, the people in this church, Lord, with whatever they might be going through, Lord, I, I just, I thank you that you're right there with them in the midst, Lord. You're taking care of them, and you're providing for them, and you're going before them, and you've also put the keys in their hand, Lord, and you've already told them, Lord, to loose on this earth, Lord, what you've loose in heaven. And Lord, you've given us the victory. And so, Father, we thank you for the power and the spirit, Lord, that is deep inside of us, Father, that's never going to leave us no matter what we do, Lord. But we are, we're saved. And Lord, we're just, we're, we're glad that your spirit is in our life, Father, that you're doing everything for us, God. You're taking care of us, Lord. You're you blessed us, Father, and we just want to honor and love you for that, Lord. And Father, we, we also just continue to pray, Lord, for the finances of this church. I thank you, Lord, that you're providing for this church. I thank you that you're opening up opportunities, you know, different, different things that we're doing in, in this church, God. And, you know, just keep providing for the church like you have been, Lord. It's not us, God. It's you that's providing for us, God. So continue just to open these doors of opportunity up for us, Lord. And we just thank you for that, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we, we bless you. We love you. And as we leave this place in peace tonight, God, we just we leave with thankfulness in our heart. And we ask and declare all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. All right. I love you all.